Now that we know our way around the circular flow diagram, we can ask how do we actually measure what we consider to be the most important macroeconomic variables. These are variables that relate to GDP, unemployment, inflation and economic growth. Now we've already talked a lot about GDP. We've distinguished between real GDP and nominal GDP. When nominal GDP values current output at current prices, whereas real GDP values current output at the prices of some base here and then keeps those prices constant over time. So if we see an increase in real GDP, it must be because total output has gone up. Whereas if we see an increase in nominal GDP, it could be that output has gone up, but it could also be that prices have gone up. So how do we actually measure GDP? Well, in the US, we have what's called the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or what's called the BEEA. Now, that Bureau gathers data from all sorts of sources, all the various federal agencies, all the various statistical agencies, various private sources. And all that data comes to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, where it's then processed and used to estimate GDP, both real and nominal, on a quarterly and annual basis. Now you can imagine that's a massive undertaking. And that's why the Bureau of Economic Analysis hires lots of economists and statisticians and computer scientists and data scientists and so forth. Now what about unemployment? Well, before we can talk about how we measure unemployment and who actually measures it, we have to talk about what it is that we mean by it. So think about the set of the total population, where some of that population is employed and some is not employed. And among those who are not employed, there is a subset that is looking for work. That subset is what we call the unemployed. So if you're not working but not looking for work, you're not considered unemployed. We then define the labor force as the sum of those who are employed, these people, plus those who are unemployed. And the unemployment rate that you hear about in the news media is simply the number of unemployed divided by the labor force. So how do we actually estimate this? Well, in the U.S., we have the Census Bureau. And the Census Bureau conducts what's called the Current Population Survey. That's an ongoing survey of large numbers of people. Around 60,000 households composed of over 100,000 individuals. That's a survey size that's almost unheard of. If you think about the survey sizes for most political surveys, they're around four to 500 people. The Census Bureau surveys 110,000 people on an ongoing basis. And among many things, they ask them, are you employed or are you not employed? And if you're not employed, are you looking for work? So from that, they can estimate the number of unemployed in the population and the number of employed to come up with a labor force and then to come up with the unemployment rate. What about inflation? Well, there are various measures of inflation that you'll hear about. The most common is what we call the consumer price index, which is abbreviated as the CPI. Now, the consumer price index is constructed from another massive survey. This one is conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
That survey surveys about 20 to 25,000 retail establishments and asks them about 80,000 or so prices. It is an ongoing survey, so they're being surveyed every month. And then the Bureau of Labor Statistics defines what's called a basket of goods, a representative basket of goods. And they value that basket at the current prices that they've just gathered. And then they compare the value of that basket at current prices to what that basket cost a year ago or a month ago. And by comparing those two, we can derive a measure for inflation. That's the consumer price index. We also have what's called the producer price index, which is abbreviated as the PPI. And it's exactly the same thing as the consumer price index, except in this case, we're looking at prices that firms pay along the way of producing goods. Then we also have what's called the GDP deflator. Remember that we've calculated the real GDP and the nominal GDP. So by calculating the real and the nominal GDP and comparing those, we can derive a measure of inflation over time. That measure is called the GDP deflator, and it's based on all the goods that are transacted in output markets. What about economic growth? Well, economic growth is simply the change in GDP over time. And in particular, the change in real GDP over time. So how much is the economy growing is simply the, question, the same question as how quickly is GDP growing. But what we pay attention to more than the growth of real GDP is the growth of per capita GDP, where per capita GDP is simply real GDP divided by the population. Real GDP could be going up but, but per capita GDP could be going down if there's a lot of population growth. But when we're really trying to figure out are people becoming better off over time, is the average standard of living increasing? We want to know what's per capita GDP, what's GDP per person in the country, and how is that changing over time? So now I'd like you to think about something before class. Think about whether you think this measure real GDP per capita is a good measure of economic well-being or of well-being in general. We oftentimes equate it with standards of living. If per capita GDP is rising over time, we'll say that the standard of living is rising over time, implying that people are becoming better off. So knowing what you know about GDP, how comfortable are you with GDP per capita being used as the measure of well-being.